Hello, I'm High Hill Knight. Welcome to my channel. I love the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I pretty much enjoy it as much as I can, not only of the movies, but I will dabble with the other shows like on Netflix and Hulu. It's a lot of content, but it's very fun for me as a comic book geek. With that in mind, now that Infinity War has been brought to theaters, and again, I love it, and it's an amazing uh, accumulation over the past 10 years of amazing movies and stories and characters, there are some questions that I ponder. Uh, now, I don't think these questions are necessarily universe shattering, and if they don't get resolved or addressed, you know, there's no big deal. But still, there are certain questions that I have that I hope will be delved into the MCU, but probably not. Now, it's a lot to cover. It's 10 topics. So to keep things simple, there won't be a lot of graphic changes. Uh, there are timestamps in the description. So if you want to jump to a particular section, you can. With that in mind, sit back, relax, and listen to my 10 MCU Avengers issues that probably won't be resolved. Number one. Wakandan rhinoplasty. The Wakanda battle in Infinity War was fantastic. It was visually excellent and full of excitement. After a second time I watched the movie, I wondered about all the cool Wakanda technology that was not featured in the battle, like T'Challa's stealth ship, the dragonfly-like aircraft, and most importantly, the armored rhinos. When I saw the movie a third time, I noticed an extremely brief moment when the Dragonfly ships were participating in the battle. Okay, good. However, what happened to the armored rhinos? Okoye mentioned that what was left of the border tribe decided to join the battle. Those were the soldiers with the energy shield capes. They also are in charge of the armored rhinos. The whole purpose of the border tribe is to be the ground defense for Wakanda, and they had a fight an armada of alien invaders. If there was ever a time to unleash a bunch of armored rhinos, Infinity War was that time. Maybe the rhinos were kept out so the animals could still be a surprise in the Black Panther solo movie, which was still in theaters upon Infinity War's release. If true, then I could respect that decision. But if the rhinos appear in the sequels of Infinity War or the sequel for Black Panther, then I bet the audience is going to have the same feelings as Okoye had about Scarlet Witch. Why were they up there this whole time? Number two, don't go chasing waterfalls. Wakanda thrived for centuries, thanks in large part to its isolationism. It's pretty much the best country in the world, from education to technology to medicine to fashion. But think of what's happened to Wakanda in the span of a few weeks or months. One king was assassinated while dealing with the United Nations. His successor failed his first mission as king, allowing the country's number one fugitive to escape custody. That king was overthrown by a royal family member that was also an outsider. That outsider king exterminated the heart-shaped herbs. He also attempted to wage a global war on his first day. That attempt led to a brief civil conflict that strained relations between all the tribes. The outsider king was overthrown by his predecessor. The reestablished king then breaks tradition and opens trade and refugee programs to the outside world. Shortly after this, a bunch of outsiders show up to Wakanda with an alien invasion suit following. Upon the conclusion of Infinity War, half of the Wakanda population is gone and the country doesn't have a monarch. Again! Three leadership changes, a near global war, a civil battle, extinction of a rare plant, an alien invasion, death of half the country, loss of leadership again, and it all started when Wakanda was being proactive in world affairs. I don't know what will happen in Avengers 4. However, I wouldn't be surprised if all that history was swept under the rug by the time the Black Panther sequel comes around. I hope that won't be the case. 
There is no way a historically isolationist country that experienced that level of regime chaos wouldn't restructure how its society operated. At the very least, it would take more than a waterfall fist fight to decide who's the boss. Number three, Vibranomania is running wild. To add to Wakanda's problems, I also bet the MCU won't incorporate the economic and political impact and fallout that was made by T'Challa's announcement at the UN. Although we don't know exactly what T'Challa revealed, Wakanda changed from being a poor country that was barely worth acknowledging on a map to being a first world empire that eclipsed all other nations in every possible way. It would be like undercover boss on a global scale. There's also the matter of vibranium, which is supposed to be the most versatile and valuable substance on Earth. A large reason for that value was how rare it was supposed to be. What happened to the international markets when the world learned that not only does Wakanda have vibranium, but there's an entire mountain of the stuff in the country. Forget the gold rush, there is vibranium in those hills. Will vibranium become more valuable, less valuable? If a vibranium spirit can take down a speeding car, then will there be a vibranium arms race? Will there be mass inflation? Will there be a depression? Will a loaf of bread cost a thousand dollars? Will there be cash for vibranium stores? I doubt the future MCU projects will touch on any of these matters. Number four, words of witchcraft. Ever since Tony Stark went public about being Iron Man, the MCU hasn't bothered with secret identities. Whether or not the heroes wear a mask or helmet, the public knows who they are. Spider-Man is the only exception, and even Aunt May and the Vulture discovered the truth about Peter Parker. Therefore, it is understandable why characters often refer to each other by their real names instead of their co-names. Unlike the DCEU, the MCU characters are friends and colleagues who should be on a first-name basis. Despite this fact, the MCU team members have been called by their heroic aliases at least once on screen. All of them except Wanda Maximoff a.k.a. the Scarlet Witch. No one has ever referred to her by her heroic alias on screen. This could be a matter of the deal between Disney and 20th Century Fox to allow Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver to be allowed in the MCU. For instance, one of the reasons why the Maximoff twins became enhanced people was because the MCU couldn't use the word mutant. That was owned by Fox, along with all the traditionally X-Men characters and stories. If Disney's acquirement of Fox's properties becomes complete, that would mean the MCU can utilize whatever X-Men references desired. But the fourth Avengers movie is probably in post-production now, and it's supposed to be the conclusion of the MCU, well, the main phases of the MCU. Will Scarlet Witch actually get to be called Scarlet Witch on screen before her MCU journey ends? Number five, holding up for a hero. Remember that I mentioned Spider-Man is the only MCU character that has a secret identity? Well, he is also the only true superhero in the MCU. Yes, the other MCU folks are heroic, Yes, they all have superpowers or stylish technology. Yes, they save civilians when they are in danger. However, the young wall crawler is the only true superhero. That's very disappointing in my opinion. The Avengers are a militant strike force. The Guardians of the Galaxy are mercenary pirates. Thor and T'Challa are monarchs. Doctor Strange probably hasn't returned to the medical field. And depending on what happens in the Ant-Man sequel, he and the Wasp perform pretty much what amounts to industrial espionage. Spider-Man is the only true hero that patrols for crime. He stops bank robbers and bike thieves. He gives directions to people that are lost in the neighborhood. He rescues pets from trees. 
And when he fights the bad guys, he doesn't kill them. Almost every villain and minion the other heroes have encountered are taking dirt naps. Nakia comes close to being a superhero. She goes on missions to stop human trafficking and other social injustices. However, she lacks one major factor that is key to a superhero and is also lacking in the other MCU heroes. None of them have secondary lifestyles. Superman is a reporter. Green Lantern is a test pilot. The Power Rangers are usually high school students. He-Man pretends to be a cowardly aristocrat. Meteor Man is a school teacher. Ben 10 is on a family road trip for the summer. It's not about having a secret identity. It's more about having identity outside of capes, cows, and onomatopoeias. For the most part, the MCU's heroes just hang around at a clubhouse or command center or a castle until some jerk decides he wants to get his megalomaniac mojo on. The MCU heroes don't punch a clock. They don't answer to a demanding boss. They don't even worry about paying for their next meal or rent. Only Spider-Man has those kind of problems. Although Ant-Man did have a few issues with child support and Basket Robbins. Even if Disney adds the X-Men or the Fantastic Four to the MCU, that wouldn't solve their superhero senses. The Fantastic Four are explorers and inventors. The X-Men are teachers, students, and occasionally political activists. Both teams only get involved when Dr. Galactic Apocalypse Tootinator starts to make a ruckus. Despite the dozens and dozens of superheroes in Marvel's catalog, I think it's a shame that Spider-Man is the only real superhero in the MCU. It doesn't seem that that will change anytime soon, if ever. Number six, Dancing with the Star-Lord. Peter Quill was abducted in 1988, when he was very young, before his teens. From what we can tell, he has never bothered to return to Terran, aka Earth. Despite acquiring his own spaceship and separating from the Ravengers, Star-Lord was content to explore and plunder all of the cosmos except for his home planet. But if Peter Quill has never returned to Earth, then why does he know so many pop culture references? In the first Guardians movie, we see that Peter Quill and Yondu have various trinkets from Terran, like a cassette player and a troll doll, but those are probably from random raids, smash and grab, in and out adventures. Therefore, Peter, assuming that he participated in any of the Earth raids at all, couldn't have been there long enough to experience pop culture and the latest fads. Peter doesn't even get a second cassette of songs until he opened his present from his deceased mother. I guess they never bothered to loot a radio shack. Young Peter Quill lived on Earth just long enough to justify why he could perform the running man dance move as an adult against Ronan the Accuser. But in Infinity War, Star-Lord promised to get a bow flex and considered himself Gamora's long-term booty call. He should have no idea what either of those things are. What's up with that? Number seven. Love is a battleship. I was very happy to see the Guardians with a brand new ship in Infinity War. I loved the previous ship because it was named after Melissa Milano, a teen idol that both Peter Quill and I had crushes on. The new spaceship, named after Pat Benatar, seems to be a larger version of the Milano. However, I'm very confused about how large the ship is. Whenever there are interior scenes on the ship, it seems that the heroes have plenty of space to move, as well as other areas of the vessel for privacy. There is also a three-passenger scout ship within the Benatar. However, the exterior scenes don't make it seem like the interiors are possible. I'm sure there is or will be some kind of MCU tech book that offers the official schematics of the spaceship. I also know that real life submarines can make the most out of very small quarters. And the truth is probably the filmmakers were concerned about telling an interesting story and having great character interaction more than the architecture of their ship. Still, 
I prefer to base my thoughts on actually appears on screen. It's hard for me to believe that so much space is available on the inside based on how confined the outside appears. It's like the Minotaur is a heartbeat away from being like the tour bus in Spice World. Number eight. Oh, 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 Captain, my Captain. Captain America has done many things. He's saved lives, he's saved the world, he's done government promotional materials, and he's dumbed them on not one, but two different centuries. However, the one thing that he can't seem to do is get laid? Or as he might say, find the right dance partner. Yes, Bucky tried to hook Steve up on a double date. Yes, it was charming that Steve still loved Peggy Carter when she was old and gray. Yes, it's funny to watch a character named Black Widow try to be Steve's personal Tinder app. Yes, Steve finally got to kiss AJ 13. I'm sorry, that's just not good enough. On the one hand, it makes total sense that Steve Rogers doesn't date. Despite his super abilities and achievements, he's still that shy, frail little man from World War II at heart. Furthermore, he grew up in an era in which men were so dominant that a guy could slap his wife or girlfriend in public and no one would bat an eye. Steve Rogers always treated all races and genders and nationalities with respect, but it must be an unimaginably daunting for him to live in a time when women are nearly on equal footing, traditional marriage has a 50% failure rate, and swimwear changed from cute and practical to patches held by dental floss. He probably had a panic attack the first time he accidentally logged onto a porn website. Over in the DCEU, there were a lot of comparisons of Captain America to Wonder Woman. One thing the Amazonian princess has over the captain is that she got to do the horizontal tango. Yes, she literally slept with the first man she ever met. That still seems to be one more roll in the hay than the shy guy from Brooklyn. With Chris Evans ready to depart the franchise, there's a chance that the Star Spangled Soldier will never be cured of his red, white, and blue balls. That's kind of sad. Hope he at least went to a couple of burlesque shows during his shore leaves? Number 9. A-Force to Reconcile Speaking of gender equality, a comic book named A-Force was introduced a few years ago. It featured a roster of all-female Avengers. The roster could easily fill a splash page with members to spare. On the other hand, the MCU is lacking in female fighters. Upon completion of the primary phases with the release of Avengers 4, there will have been 22 movies. Of those 22 films, only two of them will have featured women heroes in the lead roles. And one of those gals had to share top billing. Forget overpopulation and resource distribution. This should have been the imbalance that Thanos wanted to correct. Based on what we know about upcoming MCU projects, the only female superheroes that the MCU might have by the end of Avengers 4 are Black Widow, Scarlet Witch, Captain Marvel, and The Wasp. If Gamora and Mantis are resurrected, then they'll probably return to their usual space adventures. Not only didn't the Inhumans get a movie, but their show was so disappointing that it might have been erased from the MCU franchise entirely. That means no Medusa or Crystal. Jessica Jones and Hellcat are not going to be in the MCU because of Netflix. There is a small chance that Shuri could become Black Panther, but that will likely be temporary. As I mentioned earlier, the MCU will probably set everything back to normal in Wakanda once it's all said and done. Agent 13 and Maria Hill and Nakia are spies, not costume superheroes. God only knows what happened to Lady Sif and Valkyrie at the time of this video. To make matters worse, Captain Marvel might have limited availability. The character has been absent for the majority of the MCU. She might have to return to a different time, planet, or dimension. Her inclusion with Avengers 4 could be a one-and-done endeavor. My point is, 
the MCU better get a serious dose of estrogen in the upcoming phases. Maybe Disney should take Kathleen Kennedy out of Lucasfilm and bring her into the superhero sandbox. The world deserves more than a costume casting of Charlie's Angels or Sex in the City. And remember to address that whole true superhero stuff while you're at it. Number 10. To inhuman is to err. The last item isn't really a problem. It's more of a what-if question to ponder. As I mentioned, the Inhumans were supposed to be a theatrical film. The product was modified into a television series that underperformed so badly that it might have been deleted from the franchise. But what if the Inhuman movie project still happened? One of the best qualities of Infinity War was its excellent juggling of dozens of characters. By my count, there are at least 50 characters in the film. I'm not just talking about the main heroes and villains, I'm also talking about established supporting characters like Pepper Potts, Secretary Ross, Okoye, even Doctor Strange's Kate can be considered a character. With the exception of Gamora's mother in an extremely brief scene, every moment of dialogue or interaction in Infinity War was between established MCU personalities. 50 characters had to be an incredible challenge. Having to figure out the inclusion of the Inhumans which would have been at least seven more primary characters, probably would have driven the Infinity War writers insane. There's also the hurdles of the physical whereabouts of the Inhumans. The series took place on the moon and in Hawaii. Those are nowhere near Avengers Compound in New York, the secret Avengers hiding spot in Europe, or the climactic battle in Wakanda. Yes, the Inhumans could be teleported by Lockjaw. That would explain how, but it wouldn't explain the why. Similar to Wakanda, the Inhumans follow an isolationist monarchy. They wouldn't get involved unless they had no choice. Would the fallout of Thanos' victory have been the reason for the Inhumans to get involved? Would they have gotten involved before Thanos stepped his fingers? Would the Soul Stone have been on the moon? Would Maximus have replaced Loki as Thanos' henchman? The possibilities are baffling, but we'll probably never know. As I said, the topic isn't really a problem. It's just something to make you go, hmm. How would things have occurred if the original blueprint of the MCU came to pass? Okay, thank you very much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. I hope you'll share some comments and feedback in the comments section. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, or dislike, share, and subscribe. Once again, I'm High Hill Knight. Thanks for watching, and remember, find inspiration everywhere.